Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone who have joined us today for this session on Oxygen by Apex. My name is Manish Tiwan. Uh, we are today uh, going to discuss about something that was literally invented earlier this year when we at Apex could see that fintechs across the board are going to face a lot of challenges due to the global lockdowns. The key challenge being not being able to travel and showcase their products and services to prospective customers. And it was then that we decided to create the Apex Hyperlysium the virtual hackathon platform. And that brings me to our topic today, how global fintech institutions, financial institutions are leveraging Apex's hackathon capabilities to speed up partnership with fintechs. And with us today, uh, we have three people who know a thing or two or maybe a lot about partnerships, financial institutions, fintechs, and of course, Apex. Uh, with us today, perhaps one of the most prolific users and supporters of what Apex does is Magdalene. Head of Innovation for Prudential Singapore, a Skills Future Fellow, and a game designer. Uh, we also with us uh, have today Adam Levine, who's joining us from New York. Uh, good morning to you, Adam. Uh, Adam is the co-head of Digital Partnerships at BNY Mellon, uh, who are also a member of AFIN's Strategic Advisory Council. And finally, the man who needs little introduction in the fintech circle, at least in Singapore and in Asia, is uh, Hawk Lai. Uh, longest introduction here for Hawk Lai, President Singapore Fintech Association, Co-Chairman Blockchain Association of Singapore, CEO uh, Switch Novate, and also sits on the AFIN Advisory Council to guide us in all, uh, guide us in all things uh, Fintech. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time out today from your schedule and joining us. Uh, before we go into the hackathons, uh, I would like to start by asking our financial institutions expert, uh, Meg and Adam. Uh, we can start with Meg perhaps. Uh, how does Prudential value looking externally for innovative solution? What approach do you take in seeking potential fintechs to work with? Well, th thanks for having me here, first of all, Manish. Uh, really, really happy to be working with uh, AFIN. Um, one of the ways we sort of look for solutions uh, is really through partnerships, right? like what we're having here. We believe in sourcing for solutions uh, through our partners, we also source for solutions internally within uh, Prudential. And we actually find that the best solutions come as a result of both internal and external contributions, right? So either it's by scoping the, the opportunity statements really well and then bringing them out in an open innovation sort of competition or hackathon uh, that, that gives good results. Um, and one of the favorite things that we like to do also, it's, uh, you know, after having these open innovation competitions, uh, to not just stop there, but to really work with the teams that have shown promise, uh, bring in our internal teams to work very, very closely with them, side by side, and that's where the magic happens. Thanks, Mike. Uh, what about you, Adam? Uh, Manish, thank you and, and for the other panelists for uh, this event. Um, yeah, at BNY Mellon, very similar to what Mag just said. So we look for the best solutions that are going to support our business needs and for our clients. Many times that comes from some of the ideas we have internally, but we are consistently looking for the best idea. And that means looking at what emerging technology companies are working on. Uh, from those early stage companies to those that are much more developed, we're looking for not just a quick plug and play, but also where they have a capability that could complement some of the technology and innovation we're working on within BNY and, and really look for the best solution. Um, and, and we use the metaphor similar to the name of the events of we think of innovation externally as the oxygen uh, for the bank, looking for new ideas that we, whether we accept those ideas or they disperse new ones, uh, we're consistently looking for uh, that that great idea, and without looking to fintechs, uh, we would not be as far along as we are right now. That's 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 great. Uh, over to you, Hawkeye. Uh, since you are closer to the fintech community, uh, just try and help us understand and navigate through this very important question: uh, What challenges do fintechs experience when approaching a global financial service provider like a Prudential or a BNY Mellon? Okay, I, I think the very first challenge is finding the right decision maker in that big organization. And it's especially challenging for bigger financial institutions like Prudential and BNY, because like uh, you could be seeing people holding head of innovation and there are multiple. So who is the one that has the decision making uh, power? 
right? Uh, and then some of them, they have uh, regional IT uh, officers that make decisions. So the local office might not have the, 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 the influence to do, to, to do anything at all. So once you get over that, right, you will still face another challenge, what we call the three plus three plus three. What it means is that uh, it takes you three months to convince the, the business unit to, that your solution is the best for them. Then you spend another three months with the IT that your solution can integrate with them. Then you spend another three months or more with our compliance and procurement. So it's a very long process and, and many of them would have to pray that uh, their fundings are still there after the, the nine months of audio in dealing with them. So that has always been one of the key challenges until things like uh, epics uh, happen that potentially over the, the medium to longer term can help to solve this, especially uh, for the uh, smaller size, uh, smaller size, uh, it's especially helpful for the smaller size startup who don't, which don't have a lot of funding, especially important now because uh, currently funding is very challenging, especially for the, the, the pre-seed round uh, because uh, investors now are very concerned about the, the future prospects while things are brightening up. They will rather focus on the protecting their existing portfolio of uh, company. And we are already talking about a K-shaped recovery, right? Uh, whereby those who are doing well are doing better now because they are now getting the bulk of the funding. Those who are small are not getting any funding at all. So they are on the downward slope. Uh. Yeah. No, thanks, thanks for that, uh, uh, Clay. Because you know, if, even at Apex, our research tells us that you know it takes anywhere between six to twelve months before uh, fintech can actually uh, graduate from paper pushing and trying to uh, do these demos and meetings before they can actually secure a, a POC exercise. And this is just a POC exercise; it's not yet productionizing it, right? And 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 also another learning for at least. Uh, uh, the viewers who are with us today, uh, Adam and Magdalena, are the guys that you can connect in case of Prudential and BNY Mellon. Uh, just on the point that uh, Hawkeye was mentioning as to people get lost as to which guy to talk to, right? So, no, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, back to you, Adam and Mike. Uh, and I have a series of questions that I would like your views on. Uh, why can a hackathon be a good idea? Uh, from uh, the multinational, uh, you know, financial institution perspective, to reach out to the right set of people. Uh, Any one of you, please. Sure. So uh, for us, when we looked at the hackathon, uh, our idea was how could we leverage uh, that process to find real solutions for business challenges. And so we knew that we had a, a list from our our business, the different lines of business not just academic topics that would be interesting, but actual business challenges impacting us or our clients. Um, and then we had to go and find those right solutions. Using the hackathon and specifically what we did with, with Apex just a few months ago uh, on that platform was really be able to explain the business challenges, source the best solutions globally. And we had uh, fintechs from five continents come and participate, have them ask questions. It allowed us to refine our thinking but then get a really good sense on how what the emerging tech companies were thinking about could work with what we needed. Um, and so it was a quick way for the fintechs not to spend a tremendous amount of resources, but a little bit of time to understand what we need. Uh, so thinking about our partners, our vendors, making sure we weren't uh, looking to suck their resources out, but also allowed us to get a really good sense if we're going to dedicate our time and resources to go through the compliance, security, tech, et cetera, are we working with companies that are easy to work with that really understand challenges and can innovate? Um, and, and that was a tremendous opportunity for us. We thought that in a, a fairly quick amount of time, we were able to discern who are the companies we'd like to work with that can help us address those issues. Thanks, Meg, anything from you? Right, so right now, Prudential's actually running a hackathon on the Apex platform. So we call it Proof Integrate 2020. We um, say that this is our sort of flagship open innovation uh, program. Uh, in previous years, it was just run as a normal innova uh, open innovation program. This year, we have run it in the format of a hackathon. So uh, the, the user, right, you, you submit your solutions, um, you get chosen, shortlisted, you get to pitch in front of our senior stakeholders. Uh, and this year is really special because uh, because of COVID, right, uh, is no longer based in Singapore, this uh, open innovation competition. But um, thanks to, uh, like Manish said, right, this thing that they just birthed this year, this Apex Hackathon platform, 
uh, we are able to then bring it out to eight different business uh, units all across Asia. Our global office, our regional office is participating as well. Uh, really, really exciting uh, stuff, right? Um, submissions close in around 12 hours. And I just came out literally of a session with my colleagues all around the world uh, to, to try to shortlist the these uh, submissions that will go into pitch day on Friday. Um, and like what Adam was saying, right, it's a really, really good way. Um, we just took the last two and a half weeks, so a very, very short time. Uh, we are in excess of uh, 60 over uh, very, very high quality submissions. Um, and it's it's really a good way to crowdsource solutions, um, get to know promising fintechs. We probably will not be able to let all the solutions we are interested in come pitch in front of our senior stakeholders on Friday. Um, but we were just saying that, hey, um, the, the conversation doesn't start uh, stop there. We will be contacting some of them outside of this. Right. So it's a um, really, really good opportunity to get to know people, signal to the market that these are the things we are interested in. Right. So in Prudential's case, health, uh, wealth, and then also um, the SMEs right, that we are we're looking towards. Um, the buzz generated around this is, is really exciting. Uh, people I haven't spoken with for, for a really long time come uh, resurface. <laughs> uh, people whom I don't know, they, they, they contact me and they, they start asking questions. Um, and it also excites our internal stakeholders, right? So either our internal colleagues, they, they then get very excited. They, they come and they say, um, you know, how can we be part of this, right? And that's where the magic happens. Like I started with uh, saying that innovation really, really kicks off when the internal guys and the external people come together and work together uh, to bring things to life. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Adam and Meg. Uh, and just so people know that uh, the uh, proof integrate uh, submissions close tomorrow, uh, Hawaii time, thankfully. Uh, so uh, you still have a few more hours to go. And if you have registered, uh, please do submit your proposals ASAP. Uh, Thank you, Shabba Manish. <laughs> Uh, never a problem. Uh, back to you, Hoklai. Uh, how important is Hackathon if you're a fintech trying to be noticed by a potential customer and somebody as important as, say, a BNY or a Prudential? Uh, and what do fintechs seek to get out of the, uh, the experience of it? Yeah, so uh, just, just now I, I mentioned that uh, the very first uh, challenge is to find a decision maker. So uh, hackathons like this uh, help to, to reduce that uh, uh, that additional work to find who is the decision maker boss when when the big organizations like Prudential and BNY then organize hackathon they have all the support from the key stakeholders so there's a lot of transparency involved when you participate in the hackathon and there's a lot of clarity because uh, the problem statements are out there is transparent and there is a proper governance process to move through all application uh, process so so I would say that hackathons in the way actually democratize access to the global financial institutions. Because to be frank, uh, for, for a, a fintech company, right, they just need one big account, especially for those uh, B2B uh, fintech companies. They just need uh, one big one, one account from the FI. After that, it makes it a lot easier for them to sell to the next FI. So hackathons is really a, a great way to democratize all these things. Which is why uh, for Singapore FinTech Association, we have been uh, helping all our partners to uh, promote all their hackathons to our member base of 850 uh, upper members uh, throughout the year. I can tell you like almost like uh, every week I have, I re we receive a request to promote the hackathon. So you can see that uh, worldwide, uh, a lot of organizations are already uh, using uh, hackathons uh, as a tool uh, to uh, uh, crowdsource solutions to the uh, startup uh, community worldwide. And, and it's really, it's really about uh, uh, not about uh, not just about getting solutions from your domestic company, but also getting solutions from around the world because. Uh, various region they have various strength so you can really get a very rich set of solutions coming from the various kinds of uh, uh, fintech companies so so uh, hackathons are, are great for for the the fintech companies, especially the 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 uh, newer ones because they are they need that uh, that account uh, to, that 
that the platform, the hackathon platform, can get into the financial institutions. But there again, some of the some of the more established one uses they they use hackathon as a way to go into new market on new uh, sectors. Let's say you 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 used to do uh, chatbot for uh, banks, right? So you can use a proof integrate uh, hackathon to get into uh, insurance companies. So I was. I, I think hackathons is a great way, a great equalizer, democratize access to, to financial institutions. Thanks. That's, that's and on that note, I just wanted to say thank you to Hotline also. So we did reach out to Hotline to promote it to Singapore FinTechs. Uh, and I just like to echo your point, right? Um, I think both you and Adam made that point as well about the global reach. Uh, we literally have submission from as far away as Africa. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and and coming back to uh, Adam and Mike, what do you seek uh, to get out of the experience uh, of conducting a hackathon and especially a virtual hackathon where you uh, where you are far away? I mean, uh, it's not the traditional hackathon that we are also used to, right? It's not it's not happening in front of you and, you know, in a, in a closed environment on a 24 hour scale or something like that. Yeah. So maybe I'll go first. Um, I think it's really about understanding what's out there in the market, right? Whether you go with the solution or not. Uh, it's it's about uh, just, just getting a sense of um, what other people are doing, uh, what the possibilities are, and then that helps to shape our strategy and our approach uh, to fintech, health tech, um, digitalization, and so on. Um, we also use this as an internal training opportunity to help our colleagues understand how to better work with external stakeholders. So I think Hotline mentioned it earlier as well. Um, from the fintech point of view, it's a great opportunity to sort of equalize, uh, get to know the people internally, right? Um, for From our perspective, in a financial institution, it's still a relatively new idea that, look, if you want to do something, um, you work with somebody externally, not just as a vendor, but as a partner, right? So increasingly, we are getting the hang of it, but that um, started out as a really, really foreign idea, really, right? Because uh, we are, you know, very big on confidentiality, uh, secrecy. We have these like magic sauce that uh, we're not <laughs> going to share with anybody else, um, but you're not going to get very good solutions if you have that sort of mindset, right? So um, we progressively are getting better, at figuring out uh, what we can share. Um, there are some things, of course, that will forever remain out of bounds, but how can we also sort of give people an idea of the direction that we are heading in so that um, it's just all around more meaningful when we go out there and say, okay, uh, these are our plans. These are the sort of solutions we are looking for. Uh, it might even be that we can't tell you these things, uh, but uh, that's the general direction we are going in. And to the extent that we can do that well, to the extent that we can really make open innovation uh, something real, that's when, like I said earlier, the magic really happens, right? And so it's, it's really an opportunity for us to train our people internally as well on how to do that, right? And it won't be done like immediately. Uh, it's a process. And uh, that's why hackathons are great because everybody knows that these are the steps you have to go through. Um, so everybody has signed up to it. and. We, we sort of go through the, the paces and get trained and get better at it. Thank you. Adam? Yeah, so I would say we have a, a lot of similar views to what Mag just set out. Uh, I would go back to what Hakla said earlier and that, that 333 idea is interesting. I haven't heard it said like that, but I could see it being more like 1312 in terms of how long. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that's not a good thing, right? And, yeah. and the perspective from, from the BN1 Mellon view is we have a responsibility not just to our shareholders, our clients, and our colleagues, but also to these vendors and partners uh, to do business the right way. And so we're consistently looking for ways to get to that yes, no decision making very quickly, right? And there is a lengthy diligence process and for many of really important security compliance, et cetera, reasons that we, we can't avoid, but getting to that decision making process as quickly as possible is absolutely critical. And we've gone through some steps um, accelerating uh, that decision making point, quicker onboarding for, for POCs as a, a great way for us to make sure that we're a good partner and that when fintechs think about typical banks and financial institutions, that they know we're very conscious about how we, we partner and how we work with others. Taking that a step further for a hackathon, 
we then can find a way to have a very targeted, focused way of understanding, okay, we're not doing something academic, we're doing something that's a practical, real issue. We're going to have a very transparent way, as both panelists have said, in terms of what we're trying to achieve, what the steps are, what good or bad looks like, and then make it in a more democratized fashion of everyone, wherever you're located, has that chance to, to really prove the quality of, of your work. Um, and that virtual component allows us to get the best solutions regardless where they're physically located. It's not as much fun as at times as, as being uh, shoulder to shoulder with competitors or the, the companies you're working with. And I think many of us miss that uh, personal interaction. It's not quite the same when it's virtual. Um, but if we think about the business purpose of let's address a business challenge and all of us get a chance to prove how strong our solutions are, there's a lot of advantages to doing a, a virtual hackathon. And uh, for us, our responsibility is not just providing what the business challenge is, but getting to that point of understanding who that potential partner could be. Um, and then from there, there's the commercial negotiations and the, and the full diligence process. Um, but at that point, uh, there's a greater degree of confidence that something may work out uh, from a commercial perspective to then deliver whatever the, uh, the business solution is. No. Uh, maybe I also add in the, at this point because I also noticed quite a number of uh, financial institutions are also using Hackathon as a strategic tool for digital transformation. Because uh, for a big uh, FI, I mean, the top two key challenges are always the cultural mindset and legacy system. And to change the mindset, uh, you need the bottoms up and top down approach. And many of them, when they do hackathons, they involve the senior uh, management, each of them to sponsor one of the projects. That will, in a way, help to gain their buy-in to support the digital uh, transformation because investment in digital transform transformation, right? Sometimes the ROI takes a long time to, to come. And a lot of like uh, uh, business users, especially those p and L, I I mean, for them, they look at quarter to quarter p and L. So it's, it's hard to convince them unless you uh, make them have skin in the game. Uh, so, so I also see that uh, hackathons can be a very good tool for, for, for organizations to use as a strategic tool to uh, accelerate their digital transformation. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Uh, one yeah. of the things that we did when we came to identifying our business challenges is make sure that we had someone very senior in that line of business that supported that. Right? There's not necessarily a financial component, but if they are going to allocate resources from their team, we wanted to know they were serious about it. It wasn't just a nice to have. Um, and, and I think companies that take that approach, it increases the likelihood of success after the hackathon, um, which works in everyone's favor. I, I think that's extremely critical to have to have uh, a senior management buy-in into the whole process because that just speeds up the process post hackathon. Because hackathon, like Mag was saying, you know, it's not the end of it. The journey actually begins after the hackathon has ended, and that essentially brings on to uh, uh, my set of questions, which is around more specific around uh, you know, which for Mag and uh, Adam. Uh, since you both have, you know, contributed through Connect20 for BNY and, uh, you know, currently Proof Integrate uh, from Prudential. Uh, how important uh, are the components to set up for a successful, which are those important components that we need to remember for setting up a successful hackathon? Right. So uh, senior management sponsorship, I think, has been uh, discussed quite a bit already. Um, really, really cannot underestimate the importance of that. Um, we, in, in this uh, Proof Integrate, we have our group uh, chief digital officer uh, as the sort of key sponsor and um, CEOs from, from the different uh, LBUs coming on board. And after that, it was just uh, easy to sort of roll it out across um, some of the other countries as well as in the business unit itself, right? Um, a good reach, of course. So there's no point um, going through all that trouble, going, uh, getting the opportunity statements out, and then uh, not being able to reach other people. So fortunately for us, uh, there was Apex uh, and the fintech associations like what Hotline uh, is running, and and it's it's really good actually to see the ecosystem uh, working really well as as it should, right, in a healthy state. Um, and I think that really helps to support um, the, this whole notion of a hackathon and contribute to its success. Um, the ability to prototype quickly and to prove the concept as well, 
So again, um, we're, we're looking to um, Apex as uh, the platform um, to help us to very quickly um, build stuff out without the one plus three plus 12 that Adam mentioned, or three plus three plus three, right? Um, it was really interesting because um, once we sort of put out this idea, uh, our senior management then came back and actually said, um, hey, wh why are you just looking at, at prototyping? Uh, we should aim to get something live um, by the end of, you know, when this is over. Uh, their challenge to us actually is to have, um, have it live on, on our actual systems. Uh, so by February, uh, well, I don't know if we can do that. But, um, I think the point I'm trying to make is that once we overcome some of those initial barriers, right, then everything looks possible, right? And then we challenge ourselves to greater heights. Um, and and the, the challenge is like, just, just get it up live, uh, five users, mm -hmm. like real users. Um, and I think that's a really interesting challenge. So game on. Game on, you bet. Adam? So I, I would break it down into what we could do internally within BNY and then the, the external part. So internally, senior level management, uh, the right business challenges, and then communications. And so for senior level management, it's really, we think at maybe not our executive committee, but maybe a level below that. Um, someone that has that P&L or the business responsibility if it's an internal business function. When we think about the right business challenges, um, we got a lot of ideas from the various lines of business on what they would love some uh, innovative solutions for. But we saw some of them that were real challenges, but you needed to have such a level of understanding of our internal technology system uh, that no one externally from a hackathon would be able to provide a, a real valuable solution. It uh, doesn't mean we couldn't find someone externally to work with, um, but that wouldn't be appropriate for a hackathon. Uh, so we want to find challenges where you don't have to require NDA or break confidentiality, um, but you're specific enough that the line that the fintechs and emerging tech companies understand some of the issues. And that comes to that the third part of communicating, being very clear about what the challenge is, what sort of solutions you're open for, uh, and having an opportunity for a little bit of interaction or, or Q&A along the way so that the participants have an idea of what direction they should be traveling in. And then externally, uh, it's it's having the right platform uh, from a technology perspective, from a communications perspective, absolutely critical. Um, these companies are working very hard, uh, notwithstanding they're all located virtually, they're also working around the clock as we saw in uh, questions coming in in every time zone at all times. And having a tech platform that you can rely on that's gonna be acceptable is key. And getting the message out. Um, we've, we've all touched on a few times I don't think anyone is looking for the best solution from a Singaporean fintech or a Tel Aviv based fintech or New York based fintech. They want that best solution. They're thrilled if it comes from their you know, their neighbor, but they want to make sure that the message is out uh, to the right emerging tech centers, those innovation centers globally, uh, that then can come. And you want that, that sharpest idea coming out. So having the platform that people believe in that have those right connections globally is absolutely critical. Um, and so a lot of that, we were lucky with the, the partner here. A lot of that was uh, understanding and making sure we're well prepared before we went out to the market. Again, thinking about how we get the message right to those we want to partner with. No, absolutely. I, I cannot stress upon the fact, uh, the importance of both uh, senior management uh, buy-in, as well as you know getting the message uh, across to the right set of uh, uh, solution providers that probably you know, come around. And, and and you know between the two of you how do you determine if the hackathon was successful is it is it the product that went live or is it at least you got these many proposals and some great ideas for future yeah so we had a, a few different um, ways to measure um, and so one of that was just um, from the qualitative to the the real quantitative uh, the qualitative is buzz uh, excitement internally and externally um, and uh, the more quantitative is we had, in our case, three business challenges we we're looking to solve. Did we solve them, right? Did we plug in the gap? Um, I can tell you qualitatively, we had one senior MD uh, midway through the hackathon saying, if nothing comes out of this, this was a success because our name is out there. We're learning about new ideas and his colleagues were energized. That was great. That was not at all where we were willing to stop. Um, but getting that feedback halfway through felt really good, a good check, but we were gonna keep going. 
ultimately for us, we're now having more advanced conversations with the winners that we selected. Um, I'd like to see 100% success of, of three business challenges, three partners that we can eventually plug into. Great. Meg? Yep, I think it's about finding good people. So if we have managed to find uh, good teams, uh, whether or not we manage to work with them this time, right? Because sometimes it just might be timing, it might be uh, some commercial factors at play, it might be, um, you know, um, they, they, their, their solutions um, might, might not be so relevant to this current uh, challenge that we're doing, right? Um, many reasons. But um, we find that if we've identified good teams with good expertise, uh, these will be people we, we do want to keep in touch with. Um, and, you know, as the business grows, as our innovation ambitions uh, expand, uh, we will certainly be in touch uh, to explore new possibilities with them, right? So that's uh, one. The other one is really about learning. So uh, the question is, have we learned anything from this? Right. Uh, so it's the whole idea of you, you need to fail a certain number of times, right? Usually a very big number before you get to a, a good place. Uh, in very rare occasions, you are just fortunate. The first guy you speak to in this area works out, uh, but very, very rare. So I think from a hackathon, if um, we go in and we start learning things about um, the solutions out there, um, but and also importantly, learning things about ourselves, right? Um, the risk appetite we have, um, the the willingness to try out you know something new you know, we, we all are right that's why we're doing the hackathon but to what extent right because we, we also do have a traditional heart yeah uh, so just understanding ourselves understanding the context the market um I, I think that just overall puts us in a very good position as well uh, and i think if like what adam said that bus uh creates more momentum and energy for innovation in the medium term in the long term then it's certainly something that's really worth doing already, just in and of itself. No, no, I, I think I think that's very critical, you know, the whole learning process that it brings and, and check your own internal systems and processes of, of, of where things are right now. Uh, back to you, Hawklai, uh, as one of my final questions. Uh, do you see a fundamental shift in, in the way, you know, financial institutions and fintech collaborate uh, not necessarily due to the current pandemic situation that all of us are in, uh, but because organizations like, say, for example, BNY and Prudential here are more open and willing uh, to come forward and work with, you know, a great product and a great team, even though they may be small. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, I, it's very heartening to hear from uh, Madeline and uh, Adam uh, talking about, like, uh, uh, they are not really, like, uh, I mean, at least the, the senior management is aware that uh, the hackathon might not necessarily result in a great ROI, the, the, as in the quantitative part, but more from the qualitative um, perspective that get the positive branding that uh, the company is willing to experiment. That in a way enhance uh, the attractiveness of uh, you to hire uh, talent into your company. I think that in, in a way, is already very good because to be frank, I mean, uh, it will be rare that the very first few uh, innovation you try will result in a, a big shift in your in your sales and things like this. But uh, the, the other thing I want to touch about is that, like, uh, in, in especially in Singapore's uh, perspective, because eighty percent of our fintech uh, companies are B two B for obvious reasons, because uh, Singapore is a international uh, financial center. We have more than two hundred banks, for example. And then we have more than 7,000 uh, MNC. So a lot of our fintech companies naturally will gear towards uh, B2B offering. But when you are doing B2B, one thing that they might not be that aware is that many of these companies, they have very high uh, regula re regulatory requirements to meet, especially those related to technology risk, re related to uh, cybersecurity. Yeah, because uh, for example, the financial services industry is one of the highest uh, regulated uh, industry. So uh, a, a lot of this fintech, they might not be that proficient in terms of understanding all these regulatory requirements. So which is why uh, in June this year, uh, working together with uh, PwC Singapore, uh, SFA actually came up with uh, compliance readiness uh, framework. Basically, we specify the minimum requirement to meet in terms of technology risk, in terms of uh, cyber hygiene. And then we created a 
digital self-assessment tool. So that our members can go in and then uh, have a good assessment of where are the uh, gaps in terms of uh, understanding and complying to these regulatory requirements. And then we created a number of workshops so that they know where they can seek help to close those gaps. That in a way will help make them more effective and proficient when they're working with all these uh, financial institutions. But the other two things I want to touch on is the because previously I used to work in the uh, FI, I think uh, what, what they have created, I think is uh, quite uh, innovative also. Uh, one is called Green Lane because like uh, if you want to, sub I mean, th that relates back to my earlier point of 3 plus 3 plus 3 because if if you want just want to do a POC and you have to go through three codes, right, it's going to take the three months. So what they have done is that like any POC that's less than a certain amount, let's say less than $50,000, you don't need to go for three codes. Lah. So there's a green link process. So I think the more progressive uh, FIs can consider that. Uh, the other thing that they created is what uh, we call, uh, what they call a uh, TRM light. Basically, uh, TRM means uh, technology risk management, which is a regulatory requirement uh, by MAS for financial institutions uh, operating in Singapore. So light means as in like, uh, if you want to subject that pilot to a full TRM is going to be very costly. It's going to take a long time. So it's almost like a corporate sandbox that uh, you do it as a pilot. You set a limit in terms of the number of uh, customers you will do during this pilot. You might not need full integration, let's say straight through processing. It's really for you to test out. So you don't judge it as, uh, as if it's going to be a live uh, production, it's going to get a million uh, hits, million applications kind of uh, uh, application. That will then help you to be able to assess a lot more new innovation faster. Uh, that in a way will actually be very helpful both for the FI and both for the fintech companies themselves. Yeah. Uh, that's my point. Yeah. No, that's that's very critical and, and I know SFA has done a, a great amount of work uh, to ensure that you know everything is in line and a lot of people who don't really are aware of such things actually uh, you know fix things before they can actually go and pitch uh, and 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 i think uh, a slight shift because we have little time left uh, about 7 8 minutes left and um, uh, meg and adam before we close the session i realize both of you have degrees in law and oh. hope like comes from a real estate background uh, technically not anywhere close to fintechs and which is great because you know uh, I myself come from a hotel industry background uh, so that makes four of us uh, which is the fun part of the uh, session today uh, so between the three of you anybody can take it uh, first and then the rest uh, what would be that one thing from your past of thought as lawyers and real estate expert that you miss or don't miss any one of you well so, I'll, I'll maybe sorry go ahead Adam Oh, please, please. Yeah, I was just gonna say uh, to picking up on Hot Life's point, right? On uh, the the whole uh, compliance framework and so on. Uh, I'm very happy to share that because of my past legal background, uh, I actually have really, really nice chats with my legal and compliance people. Uh, <laughs> very important. Yeah, um, and you know, with with our head of legal, uh, he is a legal person who is really interested in tech, and I'm now sort of an innovation person with a legal background. Uh, no conversation on work ever takes more than fifteen minutes, and it always ends well. So uh, that sort of compensates a little bit for the the part of law that I kind of miss sometimes, right? The geekiness, going to the the contract terms and and conditions and all that. Um, so. Yeah, we really enjoy that part and I'm glad that so I'm able to wear a little bit of both hats, right, at different times. That's great. Adam? Yeah, maybe okay. I can expand a little bit on that since I used to wear a corporate hat because a lot of regulations are drafted in a way that is broad so that it can apply to many situations. But then the, a lot of uh, compliance officers might then take a very strict interpretation of that. That would mean no, no, uh, innovation will ever happen. Yeah, so so I think uh, it's good to let to 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 get very uh, progressively. I mean, progressive uh, uh, compliance uh, officers that that understand all these uh, challenges and then be be so on the innovation journey of the whole company. Yeah. Yes. 
Adam? So I would say I had my Buddha moment of enlightenment early on in my career as a lawyer that that was not the path I wanted to continue. Uh, so uh, while I don't miss practicing law, I, I very much enjoy, similar to Meg, having those detailed conversations with the legal team. But then I get to say, great, when can you turn the documents for me? Um, and, and that was very satisfying. But I, uh, I also make sure that uh, always treat the lawyers really well because most people don't. And without them, you're not going anywhere. And they're usually the ones that can find those creative solutions when uh, it feels like you're at a, a crossroads. So. Uh, so thanks, thanks for that, guys. Uh, I, I think we only have time for about this much. And do, if, do, do we have any questions? From the audience? Mm -hmm. No, I think we were pretty clear. <laughs> Perfect. That. Perfect for that. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Adam, Hockley, and uh, Magdalene for joining us and for your continued support for Apex. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, that should be all from our side. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.